this of this session. Um, so welcome to the session on research data management and sharing. I am Megan Potterbush, as uh, Dr. Slitzman just mentioned. I'm a data services librarian at George Washington University, and this happens to be a particular area of research for me, um, open science management and sharing of research data. So I'm quite excited to introduce this session and our esteemed panelists. Uh, Dr. Lyric Jorgensen, Dr. Noir Shah, and Dr. Raja Mazumda. Uh, we do have limited time, so I'll try to be brief while we get set up in this session. Um, our panelists will discuss significance and complexity of sharing research data from human subjects and clinical research, uh, including data from genetic and genomic research and social behavioral research, and uh, data related to COVID-19. Uh, panelists will also address policies and best practices from their respective agencies and organizations. Um, I'll introduce each panelist before they speak and then answer questions at the end as we have done, uh, we did in the previous panel. So please feel free to add questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the session. Our first speaker today is Dr. Lyric Jorgensen. Dr. Jorgensen is Deputy Director of the Office of Science Policy at the NIH. Uh, she provides senior leadership in the development and oversight of policies and programs associated with emerging high impact issues of importance to the biomedical research enterprise and the United States government. Uh, so take it away. Great, thank you. Can, every, can you hear me? Great, I have an interesting challenge where the, the volume doesn't work on my computer and the screens don't work on my phone, so I have to mix them both together to make this work. So if at any moment in time I, I cut off, please um, let me know. So um, I'm guessing I'm going to try to share my screen with you now. Um, oh, I cannot share until you give me ability. It's share now, great. Okay, perfect. All right, so, um, um, so are you driving or am I driving? We'll figure this out. No worries. Still drive. Technical. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I apologize. Thanks for inviting me here today. I'm really glad to be back. I know I came to speak with this group last year, and it was a really informative discussion when we were in um, the midst of pulling together our first draft for the data sharing policy for NIH. And so I want to take a step back for those of you who may not um, participated in that meeting to kind of ground you of what we're trying to do, and then we can talk about where we are. So, of course, the question is why share data? Why um, invest in, in this enterprise? And um, there are a lot of reasons that we, we want people to share data. One, as, a, as the largest funder of biomedical research, um, it's important for scientists. Sharing data allows people access to information that can help validate scientific results. This is incredibly important for reproducibility and um, making sure we're advancing uh, knowledge and, and health cures. Um, it allows analysis to be strengthened by combining data. And this is a really important piece because not every lab, not every researcher can generate every piece of information to solve a question. So having access to other um, high quality data sets and combining it for um, future analyses is, is a really important part of discovery. It also facilitates reuse of hard to generate data. This one is particularly uh, near and dear to me as I did um, neuroimaging with children. So teaching children to hold still in a, an MRI machine for hours upon end is, is not easy and that data are really valuable and, and hard to, to generate. And so now people can have access to that information um, without having to spend the hours invested trying to you know, train people to be able to do it. Um, and of course, it accelerates future research proposals. Seeing interesting data sets uh, can really make um, spur new, new investigative questions. Of course, NIH is a public funded agency. And so research sharing and, and data sharing is really important for the public. It demonstrates our stewardship over taxpayer funds, um, encouraging people to share what they learn from taxpayer dollars. It fosters transparency and accountability. We can see how, um, how dollars are being used and resources are being used. And it really maximizes research participants' contributions. And, and that's a point I really wanna highlight because when you talk to people who volunteer their time to participate in research studies, um, one of the things they really want to see, they, they understand it's not going to necessarily help them, but they want to help change the world. And so sharing their information to make the most of it is really important to them. So this is an important commitment we're making. Okay, next. 
as many of you are probably aware, NIH has really been um, committed to enhancing data management and sharing over the course of many decades. You'll know we have a lot of policies out there to make research data and findings more available. Um, we had our first NIH-wide data sharing policy back in 2003, and at that time we focused really on um, big, large awards to make sure we were making the most of those, so, so projects over $500,000. Um, we also had the 2008 NIH Public Access Policy. Uh, publications are made available no later than 12 months. So this is also important that we don't lock the findings of research behind firewalls and, and not make them accessible to all. We also focused on, on really maximizing access to really, really valuable data for um, advancing um, research. So for instance, genomic data sharing, we do have a pretty robust policy in place for large-scale genomic data sharing. And as many of you are probably aware, we have policies for clinical trials, um, given the importance, again, of those participant uh, volunteer contributions to research. Over the course of these, of these past decades, we have learned a lot on, on places of where we could strengthen data sharing and where we need some flexibility. And we've really now decided it's the time to shift our culture to a broad data management and sharing. So as many of you may be aware, discussed it last year, in 2015, we released for public comment uh, the, uh, a nice plan for incorporating policies for data sharing. In 2016, we released for public comment the who, what, when, where, and why of data management sharing. Basically, what are the, the meats and the guts of a data sharing proposal? And then back in 2018, we released proposed provisions for future data management sharing. What would be the policies that would really serve as the incentives and the sticks for making this work? Now that we've caught kind of these, these nuts and bolts together, the who's, the why's, the, the incentives and the sticks, we've kind of got a package together. And in thinking about what we want to pull together for a policy, we really wanted to, to yoke it back to the goals of what we're trying to achieve. One, we want to foster a culture of data stewardship. Um, in, our, in our experience, just having a bunch of sticks doesn't foster a culture. It fosters a culture of fear, and it can be very effective, and, and we will use it if needed. But what we really want to do is change people's um, opinions and views about data stewardship as part of a research project. It's not an administrative burden. It's not an extra process, but it is something that is essential to the scientific discovery. We also want to balance data management with the sharing need. Researchers generate a lot of data. It is unreasonable to think that every single pipette tip is a data point that needs to be shared. So how do we balance that data management um, importance? I mean, understanding what you're using um, is, is super important to manage, but what you actually need to share with the research community might not be um, fully congruent. Um, we also want to make sure our practices are consistent with the FAIR principles. All the sharing in the world is potentially irrelevant if you can't find that data, right? So we need to make it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable to the extent we can. And of course, harking back to that part that um, I mentioned earlier is we want to make sure that anytime we share data, it respects research participants' values and consent. We obviously don't want data shared in a way that it um, breaks our commitment to participants' trust in, in the investment in biomedical research. Next slide. So our current proposal that we had put out for public comment, um, I'm, I'm losing track of years, <laughs> in, I think November 2019, public comment closed in um, January of 2020. So in that current proposal, the, the, the guts of it are research prospectively submit a plan for managing and sharing data. Um, for us, a researcher thinking in advance of what type of data they'll generate, how they plan to manage it, and which data should be shared, is something that everyone needs to do before they start actually generating the data. So that's, the, that's really the guts of this proposal. For our policy expectations to try to carve out what that means is we would expect researchers to submit a data management and sharing plan. Again, telling us how um, they plan to manage and share data. Um, again, preserved and shared. It outlines participants' privacy rights, confidentiality, protected, um, and, and potential limits to sharing. It also would indicate anticipated timelines for data preservation and access. And of course, compliance with the plan would be expected. Um, what's really interesting about this plan, and we'll talk about it more in the, in the next slides, is the plan is the expectation. We are not expecting flexibility in here for the people who know their data, know their research project to tell us what they think is a reasonable plan for sharing. So next slide. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forget when I animate the bullets. Um, plans may be updated. This is important too, right? Research that you are prospectively planning for can take unimagined um, turns and, and winds down the road. And so we are leaving some flexibility. So if, if a year or two year down the road, you realize the plan that we originally submitted might not make sense for the data you've generated or the, or the research you've discovered, they can be updated, of course, working with NIH to make sure it is, is reasonable. As I mentioned, this policy proposal is deliberately flexible. Um, this is one of the comments we've heard uh, the most, and I'll, I'll discuss it again in a bit, that one man's flexibility is another man's ambiguity. Um, and so striking the right balance has been a real interesting opportunity and challenge for us. We are deliberately flexible because we recognize that roughly $40 billion of investment has a a lot of difference in breadth, size, and diversity of data, and a one size will not fit all for all of those data types. We also know that there are considerations that may limit data sharing. While, of course, we want the data to be shared maximally, there will be times, such as laws and policies, or um, sharing the data might identify where a group of people live based on, on the genetic profile. So all of these things we want people to think about in their plan. And there are, there are valid reasons to not share the data or limit data sharing. And so we're, we're building that into this plan. And as mentioned, it also allows for various time constraints related to data collection and or dissemination. Um, it, in some cases, it might not be um, reasonable to publish before a publication is out. Um, in other cases, it might, the data might be able to be mined a little bit after the publication comes out. Tell us what you want to do with the data and how you plan and what your rationale is for when you want to share it. Um, so that is, um, that is the flexibility we tried to build in. Um, we recognize, again, that that flexibility is, is, can be confusing, so we have been working on guidance to help researchers navigate um, some of this while retaining flexibility. So some examples of what we mean by a plan or what we mean by timelines. And then we have been working through some of those things as well. In our current proposal, wanted to highlight this, um, again, research with human participants. Um, we are not changing any rules around research with human participants. That is not our data sharing policy. Um, those are uh, other regulations and policies in place. But we are committed to promoting ethical data sharing. Um, and I mentioned this earlier that you know, we encourage the broadest use of scientific data that is in line with privacy, security, informed consent, proprietary issues. Existing protections continue to apply, and researchers should acknowledge those in their descriptions of how they manage the data, that they understand a common rule exists, that we have certificates of confidentiality, and all of those things will continue to apply to um, research participants when data are shared. Next slide. Um, I'm going to go through this one just a little quickly because I don't want to take other people's time, but I wanted to make sure, again, that people recognize we are trying to prioritize ethical data practice throughout the research life cycle, from protecting participants' trust all the way down through informed consent in the research design. These are some things that we think about all throughout the practice of biomedical research and have definitely woven this into the, the draft policy for data sharing. Next slide. So where we are on this, and again, um, I provide a lot of background for those of you who, who participated in this event last year, but um, we solicited input back in 2018 um, regarding the provisions that we talked about, kind of the, the guts. We did release the policy, the draft policy, again, nothing is final, back in um, 2019 and comments closed in 2020. Next slide. Um, we have been considering all the feedback we've received on that proposal. We received roughly 200 responses, international and domestic stakeholders. The comments are publicly available on our website for anyone who wants to take a look at that. We are now analyzing the themes and looking through how to revise the policy if necessary or weave in additional guidance um, as requested. General themes, most people are very supportive of advancing data management and sharing through a policy development. Um, of course, we have people who have said we have not gone far enough and it needs to be more strict. Uh, there are people who have said it's gone too far. Um, usually in the policy the world, um, having equivalent um, concerns on both sides means you've struck the balance, uh, but we are continuing to really assess the, the nitty gritty of those requests. Um, there's a lot of support for well-justified exceptions to data sharing. And again, there were requests for clarification. This is where the guidance comes in and which data should be shared, when and where to share it, 
um, again, that flexibility has created people having a lot of questions how to how to work through those issues. So those are something we're taking really seriously to try to help researchers navigate. Um, just to let you know where we're going with this is we are hoping to finalize this policy in the year 2020. Who knows where um, the landscape is going to take us. I know everyone is, is really busy and prioritizing on the current pandemic, but we are still working hard to analyze these comments and incorporate them into a policy. Um, something that important that I wanted to flag for you all, especially in your roles, is even if a policy went into, uh, we finalized in 2020, we wouldn't make it effective that day. We recognize pol um, data sharing requires infrastructure, investment, and resources. Um, we're working on uh, allowable cost guidance to, to help people really um, put into their grant proposals how much this would cost and receive money to do so because we realize it isn't free. So an effective date wouldn't be until about two years after the policy went into effect to help people get all of their ducks in a row to be able to comply. This is not an effort to say, aha, I got you. This is an effort to say, how do we change the culture? How do we build not only, again, the policy, but the incentives and the ability to do this really seamlessly. So it is not seen as a burden, but something that's part of research. So I wanted to flag that for you all. Next slide. Um, and then I know this is um, leading into today's conversation around the COVID-19 pandemic um, and what are we doing about data sharing? This is kind of a, a case study of why data sharing is so important in the current environment. And so I just wanted to highlight a few things NIH has been doing. Of course, all of the ICs are working full time on this, really hard trying to, to spur up different investments, cures, treatments. Um, but here's a few that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, NIH open access and computational resources. So. Um, the ICs, as I mentioned, have been doing a lot of work, and CAT has developed a data sharing resource to define the clinical natural history of COVID-19 um, in a secure clinical research data environment. And the National Library of Medicine is curating a literature hub for tracking pro, um, COVID articles, um, and there are additional resources from NIH um, on our website. Next slide. Um, two, two really cool partnerships that I wanted to talk about today just briefly are the COVID-19 Open Research Dataset Challenge and I encourage you to share this broadly and put the, the website on here for your perusing. Um, the National Library of Medicine working with the Allen Institute, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Microsoft, Georgetown University, um, and assistance from National Library of Medicine, as I mentioned, um, have developed an open machine-readable machine literature resource that allows text mining. Um, and so basically applying the resources of the external community and AI and machine learning to find new patterns, new discoveries, and really to bring kind of all of the nation's resources to bear on this pervasive challenge. So we encourage you to share this information broadly, bring all the smartest minds to the table. Next slide. And then you'll hear last Friday, oh, I'm sorry, I missed one more, um, the Research Data Alliance, um, which is working to develop guidance for data sharing under COVID-19 circumstances. This will not be um, policy work, but trying to help researchers around the world share information related to COVID um, in terms of data standards and, and some of the other things so people can make sense of the, the plethora of data that are coming in to solve these challenges. And so after that is done, they'll share strategies for policymakers to maximize timely data sharing in health emergencies. And this is what I think will be critical from this um, current situation is how do we do this more effectively in a time of crisis to really solve um, the challenges as early as we can. And then the final one is the partnership we announced last Friday. So this is fresh out the gate, um, accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic interventions and vaccines. This is called the ACTIVE partnership because we in the federal government love acronyms. Um, it's a public-private partnership with all of these participating organizations you see below. So public-private, where they are working to not only accelerate clinical trials, identify vaccine candidates, um, treatment options, and share that information in a rapid form so that all of the data used from that partnership can be shared worldwide to accelerate cures and treatments. So with that, those are some of the things that we are working on, and, and I believe you, you will hear more from our other panelists. But I, from, from this, this presentation, the thing I would like you all to take away the most is, and I just committed to making um, the research we fund and the data we generate available to the public to improve health. Um, responsible data sharing is an NIH priority, and we are looking to you all to really help us get this right. We um, recognize 
there are tensions on both sides, again, to keep research moving and how to do this with appropriate investments and incentives. And so looking forward to your all's input on how to make this the, the most robust policy proposal that works for the community. So thank you again for um, having me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Jorgensen. I am now uh, pleased to introduce Noah Shah. Dr. Shah is the director of the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at MedStar Health Research Institute, the director of the Biostatistics Score, uh, Core in Georgetown Howard University Center for Clinical and Translational Science, and an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology at Georgetown University. Dr. Shah's expertise is in the design and anal analysis of large scale epidemiology epidemiological trials, specifically in the development of novel statistical methodologies, such as adaptive dosage finding techniques, impute, imputation methods, and predictive an analytics for big data. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank okay, you. great. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, by virtue of what I do, I will be talking about the different types of data that I uh, come across and how we deal with uh, data sharing and data management as part of a team. I am uh, an applied statistician by training, and I'm uh, trained on handling data when it's available to me. Uh, the, the process of getting data into uh, an analytical format is, is extensive and it involves so many people uh, in the curation, in the acquisition, in the handling, and on all of that. And so we try as researchers uh, to um, you know, abide by the rules and policies and regulations from either uh, an entity like NIH or or our regulatory offices so that we are handling the data with care. Uh, we try to be transparent parents so others can use our uh, data for research purposes uh, but I always err to consult with the experts when we don't have answers to uh, some aspects of data handling and management so the topics that I'm gonna go over are um, you know data in general uh, the data life cycle and activities uh, for principle I think dr. Yingson uh, mentioned that so I'll, I'll uh, go quickly over it what are the stakeholders in the process of uh, research and um, um, and so why is the data management uh, plan is Im important for what we do uh, as part of uh, the research that I am all, um, you know involved in uh, I deal a lot with uh, NIH uh, requirements and so I'll show examples of uh, data management and data sharing as required by NIH and then at the end I will talk about a project that I led last year uh, that was funded from NCATS it's a supplement to our CTSA and I had to um, deal with a lot of regulatory uh, aspects of data management and sharing uh, when it comes to AI generated data um, so starting with data and healthcare data grows exponentially and um, next slide please and um, every uh, you know um, clinical data uh, is either collected during the course of ongoing patient care or as part of a for formal clinical uh, trial program. And clinical data falls into different uh, sources. There is, you know, data that we get from electronic health records, administrative data, claims data, patient and disease re registries that are out there, health surveys, and clinical trials data. Uh, and so in healthcare, we're continuously uh, faced with abundance and um, huge amounts of data that are uh, available to us uh, to do research but you know they we don't uh, know sometimes how to handle the different uh, data that we get from different sources and so there is a, a skill that we develop over the years by working with different entities and different uh, you know experts on how do we manage uh, the amount of data that we are bombarded with. And so big data is an emerging um, term that in research, and I've dealt with it for the last uh, decade or so. Next slide. So as you can see, big data is not just in volume. Big data comes in, you know, in so many different formats. The scale of the data, the analysis of the, and the pace of by which we obtain data and the streaming of data. Uh, big data is estimated to be 2.3 trillion gigabytes as of this year. 
uh, data is generated every nanosecond. And, uh, you know, we are about, you know, um, in this year, in 2020, uh, there's about 43 trillion gigabytes of information, which is an increase of 300 times uh, a decade ago. And so we are producing so much data. Uh, and just think about the, the social media and um, about the data that we can generate from uh, phones. There are 7 billion inhabitants of this earth and 6 billion of them have phones. And so uh, as infrastructure, uh, you know, we, uh, we probably are able to manage huge amounts of data, but when it comes to uh, data security, data sharing, data management, that by itself is a daunting process and we continuously try to up our uh, knowledge and our skills to handle this type of data. And so um, the life cycle of data starts from when the data is being collected. And so the researcher is the primary custodian uh, and responsible for research data from the time the project starts until it is archived. And so, um, you know, I'm involved across all of these steps, uh, but the life cycle of data and when things become exciting to me as a statistician, my team is when we start collecting data to the point, to the time when we start analyzing, and then we have to make sure that it is <coughs> shared uh, appropriately and within the guidelines. So uh, research data management uh, activities relate to all aspects of planning, documenting, formatting, storing, organizing, and you know, anonymizing uh, and dissemination of data, which all aims at maximizing the value of scientific, the scientific investment that we have put thus far and in addressing concerns related uh, to the integrity of the research process. And so during the proposal planning phase, the researcher must develop a well-crafted data management plan that addresses data needs uh, and the collection and all of that. Uh, metadata is, uh, you know, something that we have to develop so that our data are, um, you know, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, these principles are not mainly set so that, uh, you know, they, you can store the data properly, no, but you can actually make it available for others to use and reuse uh, by third parties. And so, um, the stakeholders, whether viewed at an inter institutional, national, or international level, uh, the development of the research data management activities rely on the collaborative and coordination work of many stakeholders and partners. And, uh, you know, stemming from the principle that good data management is a conduit for knowledge discovery and dissemination and innovation, uh, you know, working closely and addressing the needs of the multiple stakeholders is uh, crucial in this process. So um, what, what should the DMP uh, look like? Um, so the DMP is a detailed written document that basically we have to develop that describes the data uh, we expect to acquire or generate during the course of the research project. Uh, it should include things like how will you manage, describe, analyze, and store the data and what mechanisms you will use at the end of your project to share and preserve the data. So there you ask so many questions in the development of this particular DMP, such as uh, what is the purpose of the research? How much data will you be generating from this research? What is the data and how and in what format the data will be collected? What is the tool that you're gonna use to collect the data? Are you using uh, internet for, you know, data collection uh, methods or you're using hard form uh, or what is the form, you know, modality of acquiring this data and so forth? Who has the right to manage this data? What's the responsibility of the PI? Uh, will students have access? Will it reside in your server and other servers? So all of these questions are addressed and put into a well-crafted data management plan. And so, um, I can't give a presentation without mentioning uh, REDCap as we have been using REDCap, uh, you know, for all of, almost all of our uh, research projects. Uh, it's a data capture tool that has metrics and, and is, uh, you know, approved by the research community for data collection and management. 
So again, given that most of my work is with NIH, I kind of uh, use their uh, information, their website, their guidelines to prepare and, and uh, document and, you know, my data sharing and management plans. And so um, we, you know, um, the methods for data sharing, they can be, uh, you know, whether it's an archive or enclave or a mixed mode sharing has to be laid out. Uh, it's not a, a fancy document that looks nice. It is actually uh, the proper ways that you are uh, proposing to your uh, stakeholders, to your funding agency on how you're going to handle and share data. And so I present two examples of uh, you know, uh, data management plan that I have put together for a project. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, it's concise, but it's informative. It tells you uh, how is the data going to be captured, where it's going to reside, how is the process of extracting data and moving it from one place to the other, uh, what is the operating system, and, and you know, all the uh, things that might be of interest to who is going to look at this and, and, and you know, decide on funding purposes. And then the sharing plan uh, similarly you know where is the data going to be housed and maintained within uh, my institution what are the appropriate security measures that you know we have in place like firewalls and so forth uh, how is the data collection uh, you know happening and which server it's going to be uh, you know put on etc and so these plans as I said they as you can see them they are to the point everything there you know, it's supposed to be accurate and, and um, you know, you're committed to doing it once the study is over. And so at the end, I will uh, describe, uh, you know, a project, as I mentioned, uh, that I led. And uh, it was actually a learning process for me because it was the first time that we use data that's generated from AI machines and uh, working with our IRB office and, and answering questions that they had made me realize and appreciate the intricacies involved in making decisions as far as data sharing and management and all of that. And we didn't have readily available answers Answers. We had to do a lot of work before we were able to, uh, you know, satisfy the regulatory requirements for this project. But artificial intelligence is poised to become, you know, a transformational form in healthcare. Uh, there's not a day that passes by uh, us as researchers that AI is not mentioned. And so it is defined as the use of complex algorithms and softwares to emulate human cognition in the analysis of complicated medical data. And as an example of, you know, AI in healthcare, you know, that radiology recently and the generation of radiological tools that read, you know, images and so forth and, and is taking, you know, a role he heavily in, in this area. Um, expanding access to telehealth and uh, and in developing and underserved areas, uh, reducing the burden of on the electronic health records use and using uh, electronic health records to generate uh, you know uh, risk predictions and all of that by applying uh, some methods of AI such as deep learning and machine learning and NLPs and natural language processing and so forth. Um, and so another uh, example of AI generated data is the wearables. Um, and the smart uh, uh, devices that everybody's using these days. Uh, and so all of this combined have been shown to provide valuable data when, you know, EHR by itself is not answering all the questions that you may have and you want to augment your knowledge by, uh, you know, using some other types of data from other sources. And so with that, uh, we kind of, uh, you know, had to deal with ethical dilemmas and uh, that's, you know, usually associated with addressing issues in AI generated data, such as the lack of transparency. Uh, who's responsible if mistakes happen, uh, such as in autonomous car accidents and the fake information uh, that we're bombarded with and that can negatively impact entire populations and unfairly discriminate and bias towards certain race or because of the way the AI systems were developed. And so 
I had to work on this and address lots of these uh, issues when I was uh, designing uh, my IRB protocol to submit to our office. And so my project was to design and test a customized and interactive chronic heart failure disease uh, specific functionality using Alexa. So I used Alexa and uh, there is a tool called Skill Kit. Uh, with a voice activated, you know, the voice activated technology to, uh, uh, you know, ask my patients, my heart failure patients questions on a daily basis so that we can get an idea of how they're doing while they're in their own comfort. And so we also are, you know, augmenting this information by adding or by merging their electronic health records to identify and to examine outcomes by the end of the study. And so the design looks like this. So patients were enrolled uh, into, uh, you know, this the study flow and timeline. They enrolled and then they were assigned to standard of care or Alexa. And then um, Alexa data was housed on the cloud. We needed to make sure that they have an avatar name and not put their identifiers. And we created specific emails for them so that we don't use their personal information and all of that to protect their identity and to protect the sanctity of the data that we are acquiring on a regular basis from these patients. And so we identified and we anonymized and we ensured it's behind the firewall. All of these metrics were in place before I started, uh, you know, uh, the study altogether. And so um, Alexa was used and the information from these patients was acquired and it was downloaded. And now we are in the process of, you know, analyzing the data. And throughout this process, we ensured that their, uh, you know, information was always uh, protected and secured uh, somewhere, uh, whether it's in the cloud or our, on our servers, etc. So um, these are some of the regulatory uh, questions that we had to address when we were working on this project, which is, uh, you know, AI, uh, heart failure patients who are randomized to two groups, how were their, you know, uh, information protected? Uh, we ensured that the assistant programmed only yes or no uh, responses, uh, no names, no identifiers, nothing. Uh, the data was secure on the Amazon Web Services uh, server that we were using. Um, and so we, there was a requirement to have a private home uh, with Wi-Fi. Uh, so we had to exclude lots of patients uh, who did not have uh, Wi-Fi at home. And then uh, we enabled, uh, a, you know, a functionality in Alexa that, you know, turning it off uh, to turn off listening by locking the Alexa unit and recording stops uh, entirely when it's locked. Uh, or when it sleeps or when it's uh, when there is a forced quit. And so um, as you can see here uh, on the next slide, um, please. <laughs> As you can see on the left all the way at the bottom is the dashboard where the answers from Alexa. So this is the type of data that's AI generated. You talk to Alexa and then, you know, you say yes, no, and then Alexa uh, stores that uh, audio in the cloud. But then we wrote a program to bring that data into a dashboard in color-coded dashboard. As you can see in the bottom uh, left there, uh, the colors indicate their answers. So green is Great. That's what we hope they would say. Uh, blue, um, maybe, and then red requires immediate attention, where the uh, nurse, you know, calls back uh, the patients and and discusses with them. So this is just an example of AI generated data, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the working on uh, ensuring that the data is managed properly, shared properly, uh, you know, and um, secured in in a safe place is uh, was one. Of of the you know most involved uh, tasks I had to do for this project, but we were able to succeed by collaboratively working with uh, our uh, IRB office and and the experts in the field and provide satisfactory answers and uh, as, uh, you know uh, assurances to make sure that this project is uh, go that go forward. So in summary. You know, proper research data management and data sharing plans will provide a better and increased potential for funding, uh, transparency and better collaborative efforts in the future. Uh, reproducible research is a very uh, popular, um, you know, thing right now. 
uh, it's, uh, you know, scientific integrity and validation of the findings and results. Everybody wants to make sure that they are using data that makes sense, that's clean, that's transparent, and can be used to reproduce uh, the research that they are aware of. And then it helps, uh, uh, you know, improve adoption by the scientific community. I'll stop here. I hope I didn't go over. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shah, for your presentation. And I see that we are running a little over. I hope that um, our attendees will stick with us uh, as we are going to cut into lunch a little bit so that um, we can hear all of Dr. Mazumda's presentation and maybe even have some time, a little time for questions and answers. I really appreciate um, what I've heard so far and I'm excited to introduce Dr. Mazumda as well. Uh, Dr. Mazumda is a professor of biochemistry and molecular medicine and a co-director of the McCormick Genomic Protein Proteomics Center at the George Washington University. Through federal and in industry funding, he's involved in uh, genomic and bioinformatics research in cancer biology, glycobiology, metagenomics, and bioinformatics standards development. And his work will serve as a fundamental element in producing fair data in this field. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Mazumda. All right, can you hear me? All right, so uh, do I need to share screen or you will uh, take care of that? So next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, why compute objects. Uh, the previous two talks were fantastic. Um, they laid the ground of, uh, I, mean, I mean, most of our audience most probably already um, uh, knows about this, how important it is uh, to share data. But uh, during the talk, um, in, in both the talks, uh, there was mention about uh, the word curation came up once, I think, or twice. Cleaning up of data was alluded to. And it's, it's really important. If somebody gives me a data, and sometimes it happens, I mean, people say, hey, I put all these zip files there, all yours. And I end up having a student um, sometimes up to a year, figuring out what is in those files. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about this in terms of uh, knowledge that one, that one generates from the data and that knowledge ends up in publications, uh, which is usually most of the time when people are analyzing uh, you know, data uh, or if it is proprietary, let's say, uh, where for companies, um, that information goes into a submission. Uh, to FDA, uh, for example. So we were very concerned along with FDA many years ago, we started talking with FDA about when somebody uses some software to analyze some data that comes out of a machine, let's say, um, what exactly was done? What software was used? What version was used? Or even if there was some manual curation, wh wh what is the evidence that was tracked for that manual curation? So all of this led to the development of BioCompute. And we have been working very closely with many, many partners around the world uh, and standards organizations such as IEEE and ISO to formalize um, how do you record the data generation part and also how you analyze the data to get to the knowledge. Next slide, please. So next slide, oh, there it is. All right, maybe there's a little bit of a lag. Uh, so uh, th this is a classic example, right? On the left-hand side, you have uh, a sample and then you have experiments, you do sequencing run. It could be some other type of experiment or omics work. Um, then there's file transfer, uh, archival, and of course there's security that is that needs to be around all of this if you are dealing with um, data which um, is sensitive and then you have to verify, validate, and then you extract knowledge. And once you extract knowledge, you put it in a paper or you submit, um, or you give it to the next postdoc to continue the work. Now, all these three things I said, publish, give it to the next postdoc to continue the work. If you cannot communicate what was done so far really well, you start pretty much from scratch. So the next postdoc comes and they rewrite all the pipelines on their own. And that's 
frankly, that's a waste of money. So next slide, please. Um, okay, so here is an example of uh, how uh, we look at this. So it's just a chemistry experiment. You have conditions, you have uh, chemicals, um, and you have uh, yield. So just like a chemistry experiment, you, same thing. You have uh, inputs, you have parameters, you have outputs. You have some software which takes the input. You change the parameter, you change the input, you'll get different outputs. So when a patient, let's say, walks into uh, a clinic, and let's say they're, you know, uh, they're experienced and they, somebody gets a report saying that, well, this person has these mutations. It's all good. But on the other hand, how do we know that this person has those mutations? Because they were, somebody actually validated a piece of software, which at this point is not that well regulated, by the way. So all of this needs to be captured. Next slide, please. And this is a, actually a nice schema. So on the left-hand side is the industry. They submit, let's say, something to FDA. Again, it can again be a journal article or to the next postdoc. And they, whoever is reviewing the data and what analysis was done, they have questions. Then they ask the person who submitted. And when you do this cycle, of course, for a regulatory cycle, it can cost a lot of money. A, you know, a lawyer, you can't just email, so the FDA can't just email uh, the industry and say, hey, give me this information and somebody emails back. There is a mechanism that has to be in place. There are professionals involved, there are time. So if you think about it, if the industry were to submit a biocomputer object, that's already happening now, by the way, then the FDA knows exactly what was done. So the question answer doesn't have to go all the time. And then they say, yes, uh, I'm going to prove it, but no, this is not good enough. Your statistics is not right. You're using something, some, your, your, your power, the way you calculated is not, not the way it should be, or your sample size was small or whatever have you. Next slide, please. So the solution actually needs to be, of course, standardized. It has to be human readable. I should be able to take, read five pages of these steps that were taken and understand what it is, or I can just drop it into some software such as Seven Bridges Genomics Software, Galaxy, or Hive, or any other bioinformatics platform. I'm talking bioinformatics. It could be actually also in computational fluid dynamics. I was talking to one of our colleagues at GW. So technically, I should be able to put it somewhere, and then it would be able to run on its own if the dependencies are met. It is also a huge benefit. If I know exactly what is being run, I can also compute how much it's going to cost to run something like this on Azure or Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services. So you can actually tell before you do anything and get the bill. And that's the biggest challenge for PI, by the way, for me, is that I don't know if I should do work on Amazon because I don't know what the bill will be like. But with a biocomputer object, I can tell exactly how much it's gonna cost because we already have empirical data to use it. So there's another benefit to that. Next slide, please. So, so we, well, these days are gone almost, right? We're all at home. But when you used to go to your friend's house, you would take out your cell phone. Your friend could be in Iceland, doesn't matter. And your cell phone, you ask, hey, what's your password? And your cell phone knows how to connect to the wireless router and it works. And this is awesome. Why does it work? Because all these companies which makes all of these products, they are using a standard, 802.11. In bioinformatics, actually ours is, if not the first, the, the one of the first standards in bioinformatics where, before, by IEEE. So if everybody is using the standard, um, then we don't really have to worry about ad hoc uh, Excel files or uh, documentation. Should I put my first name and then the last name or the last name and the first name? Do I need my ORCID ID? These things are all written up in the standards uh, in IEEE right now in Biocompute. Next slide, please. So, it's, it's, it communicates computation analysis. It acts as an envelope for entire pipelines. Common workflow language can be used, research object, disease ontology, GF4, GH, and so on. And um, it's built with FDA academia industry input. It is in JSON. Um, it has usability, execution, error domain, interoperability, adaptability uh, features in it. 
So this error domain is really important. When I run a bio compute, I need to know if it ran correctly or not. And we are using blockchain technologies to do some ways of tracking what was done so that people cannot change it uh, along the way. Uh, and it's IEEE standard now in, in, since Jan 2020, 2020. Next slide, please. I think there's a lag. I guess uh, it's not coming up yet. Um, I mean, I, I can open up my um, um, something to do with my internet connection, most probably. So uh, let me go to my um, slide and see what was the next slide. So slide uh, number nine is what is a bio compute object? And it has the usability domain, IO domain, output file, input file, parameters. And slide number 10, if you could please go to slide number 10, yeah, it, it, it is, you don't need to read on the right hand side, but it has a metadata section, extension domain, usability domain, description domain, execution, parametric, IO, and error, error domain. Sorry, I got disconnected. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? I got disconnected. Okay. I can hear you. So next slide, please. So in this slide, um, you see uh, there are all these different sections in there. Uh, it is. Uh, it is not in JSON format, we just made it like this for the slide, but there are these existing domains which uses the specification that is in IEEE, uh, which allows you to put in what is needed. So there are fields which have to be filled in, and then there are fields which, are, which you do not need to fill in depending on your uh, workflow. And then people can type it in, or automatically the entire biocompute object can be generated if you're using Galaxy or Hive, for example, or Seven Bridges Genomics Platform. So these platforms have been using these specifications to generate this documentation. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go over this, but basically it provides all kinds of information. Uh, attribution, communication, collaboration is great, has the metadata, provides license information if you want to put it in there. And of course, when you have it in such structured format, it is very easy to put it in a database and, and search for it and things like that. Next slide, please. That's my, that was my, that's my last slide. I want to thank, so Dr. Vahan Simonian, he was at FDA uh, when him and I, we first started the project 2012 or so. Since then he has moved to Emblema, which is a healthcare company. Uh, Jonathan Keeney is at George Washington University. He's leading the biocompute in initiative uh, along with me on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Hadley King is the technical lead and Janisha has been the training lead. And we do work with several others. I have Carol and Michael here. Some of you may know, know them uh, from their work on um, research objects. And uh, we do provide help to people who want to move over to biocompute objects uh, or, 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 or record their, their, their work as biocompute. So please, uh, you know, feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, we have been generously funded by FDA and more recently by NSF Internet too. And we have some industry funding as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raja. I am sorry if I, I apparently was experiencing technical difficulties. Hopefully others were not. Um, but I definitely heard most of your presentation. Um, and uh, for anyone who is interested in asking questions of our panelists, uh, you can submit 
questions now. Um, and we uh, can take a little bit of time. Or oh, if any of our panelists, if all of our panelists can um, unmute, uh, uh, share your video. Um, and if you have any questions for each other, um, I'd be happy to invite you um, to ask. I also can take the moderator prerogative as uh, Julia did um, and go ahead and ask a question myself. Um, so one thing just to tie it to sort of the topic of the, today, each of you uh, presented clearly on a foundation of many years of developed practice in this area of data management and sharing. Um, but I know that it's still sort of an uncomfortable area for some research, uh, some researchers. And I'm curious if any of you are noticing a shift in research culture around data management um, or sharing or collaboration at this time where we're experiencing sort of COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, I can I can describe my experience right now as um, leading uh, the research that takes place at uh, MedStar. So, um, you know, the only thing I would say is that nothing nothing will change as far as getting IRB approval if you're going to use data. It's our patients and so forth. So the process is similar. Maybe now everything is COVID. Uh, related and focused and so things happen at a much faster pace as far as you know review and so forth uh, but you know the only thing I would say is that we are mindful of what are we communicating we don't want to jump to research findings that don't make sense and don't uh, you know uh, are not vetted and so there is some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, you know we're torn between moving things fast and and just being mindful of what we are communicating to the to the uh to our audience and so that that's that's happening as i uh as i um experience it these days so can i can i add add to that so i do feel and this is this is my friends great friends and collaborators um what covid 19 has done i think it has highlighted the willingness of people to share more and not always feel that, okay, I, I, I'm only going to share till I have published it or I have gotten my this next grant and things like that. I think I'm noticing that, which is really good. And I also am noticing more papers, people first, I, it will be interesting statistics, uh, more um, people are putting up their papers in bioarchive before publication. And I think that's a great trend. And, and yes, there's a risk um, of people putting in things in there, which is not peer reviewed. But you know, if I'm working on ACE2, uh, which is the gene, which is a receptor, uh, and there is a bioarchive paper, I already have my own data that I'm working on and that paper might save me months of additional work maybe because somebody has put it there. So I feel that this is really good and I hope that this is a, a defining moment in, in, in data sharing and knowledge sharing. Um, so that's at least what I've seen. Thank you, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I, I also wanted to highlight this uh, idea of uh, that, that Dr. Shah brought up of the data management uh, and, and analysis tools becoming overloaded by the sort of the vast amount of data that we're processing. And I'm curious uh, to hear from any of you about the considerations that our researchers should have when working and describing, working with and describing big data. I know that's, um, something that you each touch on in different ways, right? Raja, you've talked about describing um, big data and the complexities that are involved in that and then also processing it. Uh, Noah, uh, Dr. Shara. So either of you, if you want to, to jump in um, to, to sort of answer this idea of, of working and describing big data and, and some of the challenges and, and ways of overcoming those. No, so, I mean, 
There are computational challenges, right? I mean, uh, we had uh, experienced uh, our servers just crashing, literally, every time we handle, uh, you know, whether we're doing matching, uh, cases and controls from our EHR, whether we're dumping data that we need. So we did, uh, uh, you know, come across several computational, uh, you know, challenges, but we overcome these, as, you know, the time and now with cloud computing and all of that, I think these are uh, not uh, hindering the type of research that we're doing as far as clinical and translational research. Uh, so, uh, you know, the technical uh, aspects of research has been taken care of. Um, making sense of big data is another issue. I mean, that's the most challenging, in my opinion. How do you take something so big and, you know, put it down so that we can understand what we are doing with it? And that's, that remains a challenge at this point. Yeah, you know, the, one of the things I would like to add, that those are excellent points. I mean, the cloud infrastructure has been really a leap forward and part of also helping with some of the security concerns, of course, with privacy and, and other, other data sets because of people downloading data and taking it and sharing it in ways that you can't track, at least when it's in the cloud, you can actually track the use of data and see who's using it and being able to, to enhance some of the, the concerns about um, security and how data are dispensed. So I think that's been a really, really important advance. Um, how to have those cloud structures talk to each other to, to have those data sets interact for these kind of big analytics are, are completely a challenge, um, kind of like the EHR system. So um, something that we've been thinking a lot through at NIH. And then the one other point, you know, that I would raise is, is the infrastructure provided to you all to be able to actually manipulate those data sets and um, annotate those data sets, right? When you're saying making sense of the big data is really kind of the challenge. And so how do you not only share data, but you share data in a way that's annotated or with the accompanying metadata so that people can understand what that data means and use it appropriately, I think is really important. I'm glad you raised that point. So I want to add uh, one more uh, thing uh, is, is the cost. So I want to ask the other panelists. Um, so um, yes, uh, one can move to cloud computing, but some of the challenges at least I have noticed is that, uh, when you purchase hardware, um, you, there's a finite cost for the part of the project. But then when you move to the cloud, um, there is still um, the way cloud credits are or cloud costs are calculated by different universities and so there's you know I know that, the, that there, there are lots of initiatives at NIH including the strides program which is which is really really doing well um, how do you see this um, working out for for majority of the PIs because um, the number of people who are still using using big data is a fraction of the current PIs at any university most of the time, unless you are in a data science uh, institute or something. So how do you see the, the cloud cost structure um, uh, democratizing the use of big data? Or you see that it will always be specialized. People who have the resources and the know-how will always use it. And the rest of the people will just use the knowledge that comes out of it. That's an excellent question that I'm not sure I fully have an answer for. The cost part is is completely something, you know, thinking through again, NIH has developed some resources. It's not going to be the panacea. Um, one of the things we're thinking through in the data sharing policy is to, again, what are some allowable costs for researchers to be able to say, listen, I'm, I'm sharing the data. It's going to cost money to put in a place that people can actually use it and make sense of it. Curating it, some points that you raised, cost money. So how can we allow researchers to build in those costs? And how do we think about that after the grant ends? If the data are truly valuable, you're going to want to keep it in the cloud or accessible or clean beyond three years. And so those costs are something that we are definitely thinking through because I think you're exactly right. Um, uh, again, if you, you want good quality data and you want to be able to use it and manipulate it, it's an infrastructure cost that needs to be invested in. It's just, it's not going to come free. And so definitely something we're, we're working through and we'd love to hear more from you all and some of the challenges and, and solutions you found. Um, so for me, um, personally, um, using uh, cloud computing had some costs as attached to it, right? But it was only during the uh, conduct of the study and while I was acquiring data and hosting it on the AWS. Once that's over, I was able to dump it on our physical servers and work with the data there. So we stopped that 
coast and we built it we built it into uh you know the project and all of that we were aware uh and that was very reasonable as far as you know the project that i talked about but i i see where that would be a prohibitive uh coast when the projects are lingering and take years to do and 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 uh, the big data is is uh, you know needs to be sit somewhere uh it has to you know we have to find a, either a business model for it or find solutions like dr jurgensen just uh, mentioned We can't hear you. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, well, thank you, thank you all so much. I don't want to cut too too much into a, a lunch period that we've left for folks, but I really appreciate everyone's presentations. I feel like I learned a lot, and I hope that our um, participants feel that they did as well. Um, thank you all for your time, and if our uh, Hosts could put up our next slide. Uh, we will be moving to lunch after this, and um, then we'll be coming back from lunch at 1.30 um, for a conflict of interest panel. So thank you again to our panelists, Dr. Uh, Jorgensen, Dr. Shah, and Dr. Mazumda. Thank you very much. It's great meeting everyone. Thank you. Bye.